All right, so let's talk about uh, getting evidence from a service provider. This is a big deal now that everybody's using cloud services for everything. So one order you can issue is a preservation order where you tell the service provider to retain the records so you can, uh, if, presumably because you're planning to send a subpoena or a search warrant or something later. So um, here's, this is part of Title 18. Um, and so if you get a request, you have to preserve your records. Um, and the period of retention will be 90 days, but it can be extended. All right, so uh, they should, your know, service providers, when they get an order, they would typically like to contact the person being investigated and tell them, and there have been some very famous cases recently where the court ordered them not to tell the suspect they're being investigated, and that's difficult, and uh, people dispute that. People don't like that very much, but it has happened a few times. All right. Um, all right, so then if you get to a crime scene, you have to secure it. You want to get the safety of people around there, and you want to make sure that nobody's messing with the evidence, which can be hard to find, SD cards, cell phones, and other things like that. So you photograph and document everything, um, anything, record where cables are plugged in, make an evidence list of all the devices you find with unique numbers as much as possible, like serial numbers, and then you seize the evidence. Now, you're going to have to Handle the evidence carefully. This is something that comes up in court a lot. They want to see an unbroken chain of custody, so you have to seize the stuff, secure it by putting it in like an evidence bag, maintain custody of it until it's locked up somewhere, and make sure that nobody has a chance to mess with it. And there are a bunch of guides going through evidence handling, but it is pretty much common sense. So um, you take notes about the equipment here. Let me close that door. That's why I had it shut before, because they're always noisy on Tuesdays. Oh, mostly shut, but they're so noisy. They're, they're very noisy on two states. Anyway, um, so uh, you, you photograph everything, including the screens, um, and then complete a chain of custody form recording everything you take. And then, uh, like I say, you will have to defend this in court. They will, the opposing uh, attorney will look for flaws in the handling of the evidence and will often try to get you off. That's some, a simple procedural thing they can use to uh, get something removed from evidence. So uh, you got to have details about the case with unique numbers to identify the operating system and so on as much as possible. And um, then you got a hard drive. The hard drives are really important because they're going to be your main source of evidence. And so they're going to have their own worksheet with the details. And that'll, when you do an image of it, you'll record how you imaged it and then still have something like the MAC address, uh, uh, and a hash, an MD5 hash, and so on there, and especially record if there are errors. This is very common that when you image the hard drive, there are read errors, so you cannot get a reproducible MD5 hash, and you have to record that fact so people don't get upset. Um, that is often the case. You get the best image you can and record it. Um, and then you have a server worksheet that just records a lot of information about servers you seize. Um, all the information you can, you know, to so identify it, and other things like IP addresses and such, which is important. And there are a lot of tools that will help you do this, tools with report writing features to just guide you through this. You've seen a little bit of this in the forensic tool we're using, Autopsy, where it makes you fill out the case and such, and there's a lot of other apps out there to just give you a form to fill out. Uh, time zones are a big problem. If you travel any significant distance, and even if you, uh, cover a significant period of time because of daylight savings time. This is a huge problem to keep track of exactly when things happened. Um, I know for incident response, the best practice is just make sure everything is using UTC everywhere. Uh, that's a good solution, uh, but a lot of people use local time, and therefore you have to carefully make sure you synchronize things on the various servers logs that you get. Then you have to make a report, and this report is um, the most important thing, this is the primary work product of a forensic examiner, there's two things, the report and the testimony in court. And the report requires you to be a good communicator, which is why a lot of, it, of teachers end up being expert witnesses. What you have to do is you have to explain things so a non-technical person can understand it. You have to not use jargon or acronyms. It's amazing to me how many people use acronyms all the time. In every educational administrators will use acronyms for government programs and I have to keep googling them to find out what they are. You know, if you have an acronym, you have to explain what it is. And if you use jargon, funny words, you have to explain what they are. So um, 
it's nice if you can have a graphic, like a, a, a chart of some kind to present the data that helps communicate it to non-technical people. And uh, the, your report is like a scientific paper. I used to write these all the time. And the purpose of a scientific research paper is twofold, to present your findings and to explain your methods so that someone can reproduce what you did. And it's the same thing here. You have to have enough information here so another forensic examiner can repeat what you did and get the same result. Um, however, that's all in the technical appendix. The front page is the um, executive summary. So you have a cover page with the information about you, table of contents to help people, and then an executive summary. This is where you explain what you found in non-technical terms, what you did and what you found so the judge and the jury can understand it without all the technical details. Those are in an appendix coming down here later, the methodology and media and reported findings. This is gonna be the output of tools, lists of files, hashes, that sort of thing. This is only for the opposing forensic examiner to look at. Nobody else will look at it. The only thing uh, everybody else cares about is the summary, where you say, what did you find in plain English? Um, all right, then you have your biography here too, because it is, um, in, the expert witness serves a special role in court. Other people are not allowed to state their opinions. They're, not, they're only allowed to report what they saw and what they heard. That's direct evidence. If they have an opinion, that is not evidence. But an expert witness is allowed to state an opinion and that is evidence because you are qualified as an expert to have expert opinions that are given some weight. And the weight they're given depends on how much people trust you to be an expert, and that depends on your biography. And it is absolutely fair game for the opposing counsel to criticize you and say you aren't trained well enough, you're not competent enough, you don't have the right degrees or certifications, and you have to respond to that. So this is important. I've seen a trial I served on a jury, and this happened. The French examiner on the other side was a complete idiot that had flunked the certification exams that did things wrong, and this weakened his testimony. <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, so then you've got, uh, you just explain what you analyzed and what you found. And so uh, you have to just state the facts. Um, all right, you see, you've, you've observed what files you found and so on. Um, all right, and you will testify just to the opinion stated in your report. Um, that you have a written version of it and then you present it orally because the jury will look at you and decide if you think you should be believed based on your mannerisms and so on. This is the, unfortunately, for better or worse, this is the American system. Our court system is based on the idea that average humans can tell whether somebody is lying or not. Now, that has some serious flaws, but you know, there have been other systems. The ancient Romans used to have a special device to tortured the slaves when they testified, believing that under torture they would tell the truth. Different civilizations have different things that are considered truth in court, and for us, it's this. The watching somebody talk, you can tell from their mannerism whether they're lying. That's the uh, theory upon which our evidence testimony stuff is based. Does the custody chain also require two person integrity at all stages? No, just one person. You have to have a list of one person who took custody of the evidence, and then they sign, I got it at this time and date, and I maintained it securely until this time and date when I handed it off to somebody else, and all those people can go to court if necessary and testify, I did take it, and they can describe what they did. I put it in a sealed tamper evident container, I took it back, I locked it in the room, and you, know, you, you took whatever precautions you took and you can justify them. Uh, just one person at a time is enough, and again, it's gonna be up to the human testimony. The real evidence in court is humans testifying, and it's how much the jury believes them. Um, all right, and it's a good idea to have a glossary where you explain the terms in your report. That can help people follow it. So that, like I said, that's the expert witness. The expert witness has opinions which count as evidence to the extent which the expert has proven their expertise. And um, all right, they will then be cross-examined. And so, uh, there's rules of evidence here explaining this. All right, the expert witness must not state an opinion that they're not qualified to state, and this is something the opposing counsel will often try to do, try to get you to go off track. One ec excellent example of this I saw was Anthony Fauci. During the pandemic, Anthony Fauci had to go before hostile people in Congress, like um, the doctor from Kentucky, 
whose name I forget, who, who doesn't believe in the vaccine or anything. And they kept on trying to get him to state opinions about whether the government should mandate the vaccine or whether they should close the schools. And he kept saying, I don't know about that. I'm not a politician. I can only tell you about the scientific evidence, about the, the, uh, the medical, the, how, good, how well the vaccine works and what ages it should be given to and how likely it is to work and stuff like that. That's in my field of specialty. Other things are not. And he was very good at not doing that. It wouldn't, it wouldn't draw him off into stating opinions on something he wasn't qualified to state. And that's what you have to do, too. You say, you know, I can't tell you about the state of mind of the defendant. I can only tell you about the evidence I found on the machine. <laughs> um, all right. So um, your goal is to educate the jury and explain this complex concepts down to something they can understand. Uh, Normal. This is something that I'm always amazed at. Normal people are terrified of technology. They're also terrified of mathematics. If you watch network news, it is hilarious to watch them report anything with numbers in it. News anchors don't know a million from a billion from a trillion. They don't know a proton from a protein. When they try to present anything scientific, it is usually horrible. And, and I realized this. I, I went to a talk at DEF CON. And this guy had slides, and some of his slides were general information about the exploit, and some of them were full of code. And he had a thermometer in the side that went from 0 to 10, and everything above 5 was black, and below that it was white. And he said, every time this thermometer turns black, if you're wearing a suit, close your eyes. Because those would be pages full of code and stuff. And normal people, this is hard for me to understand because I'm the opposite, of course, um, but normal people cannot understand numbers, and they cannot understand code, and they cannot understand anything technical. And as soon as they see something like that, they're like afraid and ashamed and humiliated and have an emotional response to it. It's that horrible science stuff that I couldn't stand in school that I never wanted to see again. And so you have to avoid all that, and that's the thing. So your job is to take the technical stuff and explain it so a human can understand it who is not technical, which is... A skill many people don't have. There are a lot of technical people that can do things and they can spout off the technical terms, but nobody non-technical can understand anything they say. Um, so that's your real job, is to translate that stuff into human terms. All right, so you have to have a written report, um, and the written report will list all the opinions you're going to express and the reasons for them in writing, and you're just going to present them orally. It might seem stupid that you have to put them in writing and then present them orally, but that's because of the American legal system, where your oral presentation is what communicates to the jury how much you should be trusted. All right. And so, uh, all right. Uh, and you also have to list all your qualifications, including all publications for 10 years and how much money you're being paid, because all these are reasonably contributory to deciding how much they should trust you. All right, you have to be up to date. It's very good to have formal training, industry certifications, publications in journals and things like that to impress people. Um, you can be asked hypothetical questions. And you have to be careful, like I say, that they don't draw you off into an area where you're not expert. But one thing you almost always get is, couldn't a computer virus have infected that machine and put that evidence there? And of course, technically, that's possible. It could have infected the machine and done everything, and then it would have recorded those, those log entries would appear to have come from the user. So in principle, that's possible. But you can say, in my experience, I have never seen a computer virus that did this, if that's true. And that, that will help. Um, you are allowed to cite your experience, that's the whole point, and then that will have some credibility. But, you know, this is a fundamental problem with computer records. They don't really prove that a human did something. They're just a computer record. You, unless you have a videotape of the computer sitting, of the human sitting there typing, you really don't know that the human did that. You're inferring that from imperfect evidence, because it's in principle, the computer records could have been created another way. Um, all right, you've got to be courteous, of course, with everybody and dress well. One of these jobs, you really have to wear a suit and so on, unlike the U.S. Senate, apparently. But the, um, and uh, be careful. You say you know, so you state opinion or you state you don't have an opinion. You don't try to weasel out by saying maybe and probably and all that. Those won't do you any good. Um, and, you know, be careful with time zones and units of measurement. Um, and it's perfectly fine to have, like, your notes to refer to. Uh -huh. All right, so that's the summary of this stuff. Let's take a look at a Kahoot. And let me check if there's comments in the Twitch. Um, uh, not apparently. Uh, Rand Paul, that's the one. Rand Paul is the guy that gave, uh, kept on trying to take down Anthony Fauci. And I thought it was very interesting to watch. 
He eventually made Fauci mad, and Fauci was yelling back at him angrily, which is perhaps not the best thing to do, but he almost never got Fauci to deviate from doing just the scientific facts. He did say things like that, and I'm, I'm not, I don't think you want to be doing that in court. But um, they will, of course, try to make you angry. They will try to insult you. They will try to do anything to make you look stupid. That's why one of my um, forensic teachers that was very good told me, I, I'm teaching you all these computer forensic things and all about hard drives and stuff, but he said, I always warn my clients, I'm not going to court. My sister is a lawyer. I know what they do in court. I'm never going to court. If you need testimony, you need somebody else. Um, then another guy I know was like a real sort of showman. He loved going to court. He would always win. He would always humiliate the other guy. He was, you know, reminded me sort of a Donald Trump that way. He loved the show. He loved the combat. He was good at it. It's a personality test, kind of, whether you can, uh, whether you can present your stuff under hostile conditions and defend yourself. That's why most of the Republicans I hear in focus groups this is why they love Trump, because he's a fighter don't really care that he's dishonest and criminal. They like the fact that he's a fighter. And Chris Christie is quite a fighter too. He was a prosecutor and you can tell. base and he's got no future in politics, but he is a, a, a fighter. still coming in. I like the icons. Somebody had fun. All right. All right. So what process do you perform by taking photographs? That's of course, documenting the scene. Before you seize things or move cables or anything, you photograph it all. Which one of these will prevent file deletion? That's of course a preservation order. Um, all right. All right, what part of the report lists the college degrees of the examiner? of course. All right. And what part includes photographs of seized objects? Those are going to be exhibits. All right. <laughs> I get confused. All right. All right. 
So, let me stop this recording.